Okay, so we've reached the end of the last chapter in the book, and uh, it's the Pacific realm, it's the it's the the Antarctic realm, and there's not a whole lot of people here, right? It's the the least populated of all the realms we've studied, and yet geographically it's the largest when we include all the 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 land mass of Antarctica as well as the the ocean uh, that this chapter covers. Um, and really, as an introduction to this, I think the points to ponder at the end of chapter 12 are really, really important because um, the first one raises the issue of climate change. The fact that there aren't that many people who live here, but the people who do live here live on islands. Quite often, they're low-lying islands that could be impacted by climate change. And what are the other governments of the world? Um, what kind of responsibility do they have uh, to protect these very vulnerable populations? The second point has to do with Fiji receiving support from Beijing for officially recognizing the People's Republic of China, PRC, but not Taiwan. Palau, on the other hand, gets support from the Taiwanese for officially recognizing Taiwan, but not the PRC. So these little island nations uh, are not that significant apart from the, dipl the diploma diplomatic issues, um, such as who can you have on whose team. Um, and then finally, Singapore, located almost directly on the equator, has requested and been granted observer status to monitor the meetings of the Arctic Council because of the impact the possible opening of ice-free far northern passages will have on global shipping. So that is very interesting. Singapore, tiny, tiny little city-state near the equator, is keeping an eye on things in the Arctic because of the potential that global warming has to change the trade routes. And that's what Singapore makes its money on is international trade. So um, those are all really interesting points to ponder as you explore the topics here in chapter 12. Okay, so we're talking about the Pacific realm. So what is the Pacific realm? Well, it's, it's all this, it's all these islands all these islands in the in the Pacific, with the exception of Philippines, Indonesia, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, but all these guys I'm gonna try to, you know, plus of course we can got to include gotta include Antarctica in there as well. So even we go into Easter Island and such. All these this huge huge realm is all part of the area that we are considering in this chapter. So a lot of the islands are not even inhabited, but those that are, um, you know, are they independent nations? Are they parts of commonwealths, et cetera, et cetera? And a lot of them have been colonized. A lot of them have been annexed. The main thing with a lot of these is that they are all um, dependent in some form or fashion on the outside world. They're not self-sufficient. A lot of these would not continue to exist if it weren't for uh, foreign aid. Okay, so the whole section from pages 477 through like 479, very interesting um, in this day and age where shipping is important, fishing is important, and the rights to mineral and fossil fuel uh, resources are very important. All this comes into play when we start talking about, well, where does the boundary of a state end? Does it end just at the water water's edge? Well, no. Um, many countries are laying claim to their boundary waters and the and the seafloor beneath those boundary waters. So it's very interesting to uh, to read about what's called exclusive economic zones, EEZs, from pages 477 through 479. So again, the scramble for the sea, you know, who who is the, the arbiter? Who's the judge? Well, the United Nations is trying to put together a uh, an organization, the Universe, United Nations Conference on the Law of the Sea, um, where coastal states are essentially trying to, to figure out how far do boundaries uh, extend? What happens when you have overlapping boundaries? Um, so, you know, the maritime boundary problems. Uh, the problem is, you know, first of all, enforcement of violations. You know, who's, who's responsible for that? And any of these agreements really depend upon the cooperation 
and abeyance by the participating countries. Okay, so now we turn our attention to the individual regions that make up the overall Pacific Rim, one of them being Melanesia. And as you can tell from the different islands that make up Melanesia, uh, Papua New Guinea is uh, by far the largest country in Melanesia. Um, and one thing that's made Papua New Guinea increasingly important are the oil uh, and mineral reserves that are being discovered. Uh, which is very important, increases the linkages between Papua New Guinea and Australia, which is its leading trading partner. But also, of course, China is interested in those resources, as well as Japan, farther to the north. Okay, then moving on to the Solomon Islands. Now, the Solomon, Solomon Islands are actually made up of uh, more than a thousand islands. Only about 80 of them are inhabitable. And of those 80 or on those 80 about 120 languages are spoken so that's uh, quite remarkable and, and quite telling of a fragmented population and speaking of a fragmented population we turned our eyes toward new caledonia which was a established as a french penal colony and so there's a, a large population of french descendants of those original uh, penal colonists um, and there's, of course, tension with the indigenous population as well. And one thing that's also notable about New Caledonia is the amount of nickel that is available there. So it does have some mineral resources at its disposal. Then finally, Fiji, which is way in the eastern part of Melanesia, also has its own internal political tensions based on essentially different cultures and different uh, backgrounds. You have the indigenous population as well as the South Asians uh, population who were brought in initially to work the sugar plantations during the Br British colonial period. And, uh, the, the island has now been able to leave or was suspended from the British Commonwealth and notice that it's the Chinese that have come in and filled that vacuum. Uh, so the Chinese again are becoming more and more involved in the geopolitics of this region. Okay, then north of the Melanesia region is Micronesia. And these are essentially small islands, uh, some un uninhabitable, some habitable. Uh, and we make the distinction between high islands and low islands. Low islands are uh, not volcanically active. Some of these are essentially coral atolls that have grown on top of old volcanic islands, um, but they are very low relief, not very tall. Uh, poor soils, small populations, mostly fishing uh, and subsistence, subsistence agriculture. Uh, on the high islands, being volcanic in origin, they have much better soils, and so therefore you have a more diversified crop base and therefore a lot larger populations. I encourage you to read on page 483 a whole box about Kiribati, um, which is actually a grouping of islands that spans between Micronesia and Polynesia. And these are all, for the most part, low-lying islands and very susceptible to climate change. The Marshall Islands are essentially a, a, a U.S. holding. Um, and this is actually where the United States did a lot of nuclear testing back in World War II. And now these islands are largely dependent upon the assistance they receive from the United States. Uh, in, in return, these, these independent nations uh, commit themselves to avoid foreign policy actions that are contrary to American interests. Many of us have probably heard of Guam and may not be familiar with where it's located. Well, it's also part of this Micronesia realm. And again, it's a uh, territory of the United States. Uh, there is a military base there and tourism also uh, helps to keep Guam uh, Guam's economy supported. And Nauru is a uh, is a country or a republic um, that at one time had a fairly high uh, GDP per capita income, around twelve thousand um, dollars, and that was largely because of the phosphate deposits that were used in the making of fertilizer which it would, it would then sell to Australia and to New Zealand. However, 
those phosphate mines are are beginning to dry up. So there is a question as to where, where Nauru's economic future lies. Okay, then finally we turn our attention to Polynesia. Poly meaning many. And you, when you hear Polynesia, you may uh, have uh, ideas of tropical paradise, you know, whether it's Hawaii or Tahiti, uh, that's probably what you what comes to mind. Um, however, in, as, as mentioned on page 485, modern descriptions of, of a Pacific Polynesian paradise of emerald seas, lush landscapes, and gentle people distort harsh realities. Polynesian society was forced to accept much loss of life at sea when storms claimed their boats. Families were ripped apart by accidents as well as by migration. Hunger and starvation afflicted the inhabitants of smaller islands, and the island communities were often embroiled in violent conflicts and cruel retributions. One of the harsh realities, of course, uh, is that the more developed of these countries, such as or so, or the, of these islands, such as Hawaii, which has been now a state uh, in the United States since 1959, uh, is that the more uh, developed the island is, the less of its unique Polynesian culture uh, remains. So a lot of the culture has become fragmented by tourism, by development. This animation has eight slides to it and uh, worth going through at least to reinforce not only the locations of the different regions within the realm. We're talking Micronesia, Melanesia, Polynesia, but also making the distinction between high and low islands and how the uh, the way those islands are, are created affects the uh, economic viability of those islands. Okay, so finally we move on to the Antarctic, and this is truly a frontier in the sense that it's not been completely explored, and not everything is known about. It. There's still a lot of unknowns when it comes to the Antarctic. One thing that is known is that the world community has essentially tried to take a hands-off approach. Uh, as is mentioned on page 487, there is an Antarctic Treaty, which is currently in effect, which uh, ensures continued scientific collaboration, prohibits military activities, safeguards the environment, and holds national claims in abeyance. Uh, so various nations have laid claim to Antarctica and essentially have partitioned off the, uh, the continent uh, in kind of a pie chart. But actual exploitation of mineral wealth, et cetera, et cetera, is right now in abeyance due to the Antarctic Treaty. Notice also that the Antarctic Treaty does not deal with the boundary waters. There are no boundary or maritime claims for now. And part of that is because of the, the, the nature of Antarctica is being covered in ice. So where do you define? Where is the edge of the continent? Where do you start your boundary water definition? Now turning our attention to the Arctic Ocean uh, and, and the North Pole, uh, unlike the South Pole, which is actually there's land underneath all that ice. Underneath the ice in the Arctic, there is nothing. It's just an ocean. Um, and so the question is, well, how, you know, who has the, the rights, the boundary waters, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, to the Arctic realm. And this will become a big, big deal because the Arctic is melting rapidly. Uh, there will be more access and more of a drive to accessing the mineral and fossil fuel resources uh, under the Arctic Ocean. 